been 10 years since those planes hit the World Trade Center, the Pentagon in Washington and that field in Pennsylvania, taking 2,996 lives. There are thousands of stories that come from that day, from the people who were there, from those who lost loved ones, to the people who reported the news to the world, from you and me. These are the stories from the 5AA family. I was working in the study across from Susie watching it on the telly in the bedroom. In fact, I was on leave from uh, 5AA, so I wasn't going to work the next day, so I was working late, and she said, come and have a look at this. And we then sat, or sat in bed transfixed, and just increasingly disbelieving and, and horrified. It, it, it was very difficult to watch live and at the same time think, this is really happening. It was so, so incredible that it was almost, no, I can't be. You'd have to every now and say, this is real, this is so awful, this is real. I was fast asleep because I was on the very early start the next morning, 4am uh, at work in those days, and uh, my wife came in and told me, and I said, I remember, she said, America is under attack, and she woke me up to tell me that, obviously, and I said, that's nice, rolled over, and went back to sleep. I was in that first deep sleep you get when you first go to bed, 9, 10 o'clock at night, uh, for an early start the next morning, and then the phone rang, and it was people from work saying, you better come in. So at midnight I was here, it was just unbelievable. I was um, in my car driving to work, because I was doing breakfast, I was starting at 4 o'clock in the morning, and so I'd been asleep during the whole thing. Uh, and I was driving to work and I was listening to the radio and I was wondering what I was listening to. Uh, it was either CNN or CBS or something and we were taking live program on 5AA. And coming through halfway in, no one had sort of back announced what had happened. And I was sort of flicking stations trying to find out what was going on and everyone had programs listening to CNN or CBS or BBC. And, but it wasn't until I actually got into work and sat down in front of the TV screen and saw it that I sort of grasped what had happened and, and what was going on. Um, and I think I actually sat there for about half an hour in front of the TV trying to grasp what was going on and what had happened. Um, and, yeah, just in total disbelief. Sitting right here in the studio, actually doing a, a regular... Uh, interview with uh, Kim Bennett, who's a, a financial advisor in the studio, and uh, I happen to have Sky Channel, which I have on normally in the studio here, and we're talking away, and some news came through that a plane had hit the, uh, the, 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 the tower, so I switched it over onto Sky at that point, and we saw a plane going to the side of the window. We made comment on the air saying, have a look at that, some dickhead has just flown a small plane into the, the side like they did in, in, in the Second World War, a bomber flew into the side of the uh, the Empire State Building. But hell, after that, phew, that's when it all happened. I do, but I recall it because I missed it. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. But I was doing breakfast radio at that stage. And I went to bed early. And I think the attacks happened at about 10.30, 11 o'clock, Monday night here in Adelaide. And I was in bed, sound asleep. And then when I woke up in the morning, I was listening to another program and it was a terrific interview by some writer and I was immediately engaged with that and I was listening to that all the way to work. And then it wasn't until I actually got to work and I saw the lights were ablaze and the boss was in and there was a general hubbub and I walked in and I said, what's going on? So I missed the whole thing. And I've been ambivalent about that ever since really because I wished somebody had woken me up for it. Obviously, I would love to have seen that, seen history in the making. But as soon as I say that, I feel guilty for saying that too, because how can you love seeing something so, hor so horrible, so, so ghastly, which it was? Yes, and to my enormous professional embarrassment, it was the next day, because I had my own um, very personal drama unfolding in my life at the time. So for me, uh, 
it's a really weird disconnect I almost feel with 9-11 professionally because at the time I was going through the motions at my workplace but I was involved in far bigger stuff at home because my mother was dying. Did that add to your sadness? Obviously that's a terribly emotional time. Did yeah. everyone else's emotion of that time add to yours? Do you know what? That, that's the difficulty I have looking back is I have very little recollection of my response to 9-11 at the time because I couldn't afford to engage with it emotionally. I had such major stuff happening in my own life away from work that all I could do to cope was go to work, deal with it and come away. But I felt terribly embarrassed. All my colleagues at Channel 7 were saying, oh, isn't it amazing? Have you seen the footage? I've been up all night. I've been watching this. I've been listening to that. I've been doing all of this. And I was thinking, oh my God, I haven't been doing any of that. But I couldn't. I A, didn't have time. And B, I didn't have any energy left for that sort of engagement, even professionally. All I could manage was to engage professionally in presenting the stories. Um, and away from work, I was just so consumed by what else was happening in my life that um, it, it does create a real sense of ambivalence for me professionally because I know it should be, as a journalist, it should be the biggest news event that ever happened in my professional career. But it couldn't be at that time. So I have this really strange sense of disconnect with 9-11. With yeah, absolutely. I was. Uh, I remember it really well, like I suppose most people do. I was on the phone to my girlfriend at the time, um, and I remember it because she was quite matter-of-fact in the way that she said something had happened. She was saying to me, there's been a plane that's crashed into a building, and at the time I thought, oh, okay, well, we've had a prop plane that's crashed into a warehouse or something or other, and, and uh, she was quite insistent with, with saying, flip the channel, flip the channel at the moment, and there's something incredible that's happening, and I flipped it over, and said, no, that's just not a building, that's that's the Twin Towers. Um, and at that stage, it was only one that had gone up. And I, I just remember thinking it was, uh, coming from a position of expecting something that was so a naff news story, and seeing that was just incredible. Did you watch live when the second plane hit the tower? Yeah. Yeah, I was standing there with, with my father, because I'd gone downstairs and said to him, hey, you've got to turn this on, this is incredible. And he said, oh, is this a replay? And as we're watching it, we said, well, no, it can't be. The, the other one's already on fire. Uh, that was surreal. That was watching something live, because I effectively missed the first one, like everyone had, because the coverage obviously only starts after uh, the first plane hit. But seeing that live uh, defies belief. It defies belief. We thought it was a replay, and no, it was something that... Um, something that we'd never seen, something we couldn't explain, and it was probably the moment when everyone said, no, this is not just an accident. This is not just something that's gone horribly wrong. This is, this is something we've never seen before. For me, the incidents came much later. We were visited here at 5AA in this studio by two firemen who were going around promoting the Fireys games and talking about recovery and, and hope and so on. One guy, big Irishman, was on top of it. And then there was this lovely hunk of an Italian, still very much Italian-American guy, and he looked like he was grappling with it a bit. And, and sadly, I've heard since that he, he's just not in a good way at all. He, he is no longer a fireman. He can't hang it. So there are thousands, I'm sure, of people like him for whom this will be a dreadful moment. It, it represented the change in their life they couldn't cope with. Look, I remember uh, one of the first interviews I did was with a Labor senator whose name I've forgotten, actually. She's moved on now. She's not in politics anymore. Rosemary was the first name, but she was in New York and, and just downtown. So we rang her. It would have been 2 a.m. here at local time where we rang her. So at this stage, only four hours at the most after the attacks. And she was as shocked as anyone, and she explained. And she was, you know, you could hear in her voice just the, the fact that nobody really knew what was going on were there other planes on their way? What was going? You know, nobody knew, and and she just described what she'd seen, and she was as shaken up as could be. You know, she wasn't very far away from the World Trade Center at the time, and and that just I, I remember that. You know, tracking her down, ringing her. We knew she was there for a trade mission or something, and uh, uh, Rosemary Crowley, I reckon it was, and uh, and yeah, just spoke to her, and she was shocked, and, and I'll never forget that. Just finding her and speaking to somebody in New York for the very first time hours after it happened one particular case where there was a lady and a man and 
uh, you could see them, they were standing sort of on the ledge of the building and they held hands and just jumped off together. And I was thinking, why would you do that? And later on it, it came about that it was so hot and the fire and the smoke and everything, they couldn't see, they couldn't breathe. And it was so hot, it was burning their skin off. Um, and that sort of makes you think, well, yeah, now I sort of understand. But at the time you were thinking, what are you doing? And then the camera would pan in on them and just follow them all the way down to the bottom. And it's just, it makes me feel sick even now. And that's just something that I'll never forget. Yeah, there's so many images that the, the dust coming around the corner and people running in their thousands away from the uh, the tower and this massive pool of smoke looked like a sort of a, a cloud coming in to eat everybody up was coming towards them from behind. It must have been absolutely terrifying. Because it's funny, in, in remarking about my son, the following day when I rang Mark and, I, and, and uh, he said to me, oh, the whole thing has changed. The attitude of the people even in New York who wouldn't say hello or shit for a shilling uh, in, in New York to you were actually walking up to people and saying, are you okay? They were friendly. They were nice. They, they stopped you in the street. They stopped you in a lift. Uh, so it's, it's that sort of image that I can remember of what I've seen New York and I know how New Yorkers behave. And then this, to hear about the New Yorkers behaving the way they were, it changed the whole, the whole city. The images of the firefighters are, are quite... They, they sort of seared themselves into my brain. There's one shot of a guy in particular who I'm sure died. But he's got a, a, an air tank over his shoulder and he's walking towards the towers and he's looking up. And you can see there's fear in his, in his face but he went inside anyway, and I'm just, I can't help but put myself in his place. Uh, it's a terribly courageous thing for him to do, but could I be that courageous put in, in those same circumstances? And, and I see that every time I see his face. What I find is that in advance of the 10th anniversary, for example, I'm, I'm interested in stories behind it much more than I am in reviewing all that footage as dramatic and extraordinary as a lot of that footage is and a lot of the stories that came out of it were. I'm, I'm more interested in the, the other stories behind it so I'm, and I'm very interested in how uh, the world has responded over the 10 years and I find that quite intriguing. And as recently as this morning, I was staggered to hear uh, someone we were speaking to from SBS, who's in America at the moment on the eve of this 10th anniversary, say that the overwhelming feeling in America is um, that they've moved on. That's her response. Of course the people who were intimately involved, people who lost people, people who were directly involved on the day, for them 9-11 is still a very potent force in their lives. But for the vast majority of Americans, and she'd just been interviewing the Deputy Secretary of State at the time of 9-11, and he's not even going to be in the country. His life's moved on to the point where he's going to be at a conference in Singapore on the weekend when it occurs, or on Monday there to our time when it occurs. So that was... I found that a fascinating piece of information to come out of America on the eve of the 10th anniversary was that this correspondent from SBS was saying, well, interestingly, uh, a lot of people seem to be going, yeah, well, that was then, this is now, we've got different fish to fry, and of course we remember, and for those that were directly involved, of course it's hard and harsh and poignant, and with them it lives with them every day, but for the vast majority, they've moved on to, to other issues. So I think that's an interesting thing to to reflect on too after a 10 year anniversary. I think the media tends to make out as if the whole of America will stop stock still. And when, in fact, I doubt that that's the case. There's so many images, especially. Um, I was just only remarking to someone today, obviously we've been covering it a fair bit in breakfast, that as far as watching images of tragedy, we see so many of them these days in, in TV coverage. It's almost, um, it's incredible how invasive that, that sort of thing is now. That, you're a bit desensitised, but for something for me, I've never been desensitised to September 11. It still it makes the heart jump a little bit. And the one that makes me still feel sick in the pit of my stomach is seeing people jumping out of the building. That makes me feel deeply uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, it, it still resonates. It's very primal watching that, that sort of imagery. And have you heard stories of people, survivors and families of loved ones? Have you 
are there any of their stories from that day that you can recall? Well, I, yeah, continuing on from that sort of theme of how the sort of media coverage we get now and the sort of level and closeness to the people, seeing text messages from people on the planes or, or people caught under the rubble, hearing voicemail, uh, it's haunting. Um, and in some cases, it tended to be quite inspiring. The firefighters especially, I know they get brought up in the context of September 11 and going up the Twin Towers, but um, it's those sorts of stories. It's the raw information and data. It's hearing the voice at the time it was happening. It's seeing the hurried text message. Those are the things that have stayed with me, probably as much as the longer and inspirational stories. It's, it's seeing people at the moment caught in that instant that, uh, that stays with me. So those are the stories from the 5AA family from that fateful day, September 11, 2001. We send this out to all the 2,996 people who lost their lives that day. We also think of their friends and family who miss them still, to the emergency services who are still struggling with what they saw that day. If you would like to share your story of where you were and how you felt after September 11, please leave a comment below. We'd love to hear from you.